Um, just before we start, I'd just like to acknowledge that the land we meet on today is the traditional land for the Ghana people and that we respect their spiritual relationship with their country. Um, we also acknowledge the Ghana people as their traditional custodians of the Adelaide region and that their cultural and heritage beliefs are still as important to the living Ghana people today. Um, so my name is Ali Amin and I'm the um, Adelaide University Student Representative Council President and I'm just helping Stephen and the Economic Club run this event today as well as various other organisations supporting us. Um, so just, I guess, before we start, I'd also like to thank the audience for it. <laughs> um, it's Mad March and of all the places you chose to be here, which is a uh, good to see. <laughs> um, so in Australia, it's all too easy for us to take our more or less comfortable lives for granted. Too easy to be complacent, too easy to imagine that we live in a country where everyone has a fair go, where an effective system exists to support those who are unlucky and disadvantaged, and where all those people need, all those people need to do is to respond appropriately, appropriately to incentives that they can pull themselves up by the bootstraps. Too easy to ignore the fact that many of us are just a few life events away from involuntary employment in, sorry, invol involuntary poverty, unemployment, and homelessness. But that, for many people, is the reality. A family breakdown, the loss of a job, mental illness, or a variety of other factors can be enough to turn your life upside down, turn your life upside down. And for a long time now, for those who fall off life's tightrope in one way or another, there's been no effective social safety net to support them to make sure there is a secure roof over their head, to guarantee them non-poverty level of income, and to keep them included in social networks and employment. This should not and need not be the case. In one of the richest countries in, in the world have, that the world has ever known, we ought to be able to help people when they need help and to keep them secure. Our three speakers this evening are going to talk about homelessness, poverty, and unemployment and perhaps make some suggestions about how we might go about lessening both their extent and their impact, and making sure that this really is a country with the fair go that it's meant to have. They will talk, about for, they will talk um, for around 15 to 20 minutes, and um, we'll move on to questions at the end after all speakers have finished. Um, so introducing our first speaker, um, Alice Clark. Um, Dr. Alice Clark is, widely is a widely published social scientist with a PhD from the University of South Australia, and she spe specialises in research, policy analysis, and community engagement um, with demonstrated capacity to form ethical and respectful relationships with vulnerable individuals and minority groups. With 30 years' experience in the non-government and government sectors, she has managed a diverse range of projects as well as research and policy roles at a senior level. She is a passionate advocate for individuals on a system level with a proven ability to influence our political systems. She is the Executive Director of Shelter SA, Chairperson of National Shelter, an adjunct research fellow at the University of South Australia, Chairperson of the Regulation and Accountability Working Group of the Human Services Partnership Forum, and an academic reviewer for both the Australian Journal of Social Issues and the Australian Journal of Social Health. Um, we are very grateful that she has made time today to talk to us this evening. Please welcome her. Uh, hello everybody and thank you for that very nice introduction and uh, to Stephen for uh, organising tonight. It's great to see you all. I'd also like to acknowledge uh, that we're meeting on the land of the Ghana people and uh, pay my respects to Elders past and present. And I always reflect that that acknowledgement is quite ironic, seeing uh, that Aboriginal people are some of the most disadvantaged people in the country when it comes to where they live and how they live and uh, our focus on poverty. So uh, thank you for that. So if you haven't heard of Shelter SA before, we're the peak body for housing in South Australia. We um, don't do individual advocacy, unfortunately, and we don't have any accommodation. We're a policy and research organisation, uh, which means when any policies to do with housing um, are being developed or implemented, we are at all laws um, being reviewed and regulations. We're very interested in those things and we aim to influence them to have positive outcomes for South Australians. 
Uh, we cover the whole state of South Australia, so we're very busy often. Um, and while it's uh, been said I'm going to talk about homelessness, leading to that point I'm actually going to talk about housing affordability because housing, of, housing is actually the antidote to homelessness. Um, but while we have so much poverty in this country, it's very <coughs> difficult for people to access the housing they need and want. So this might be a bit of a whirlwind. Stop me if I'm going on for too long, won't you? But uh, what we're seeing is that home ownership <coughs> is on the decline. And this is a direct result of housing affordability. Um, the price of land and the price of housing has gone up so rapidly in Australia um, where incomes have not kept up with that growth. So um, you don't need to focus too much on the detail of this uh, graph, but it's basically just to illustrate that home ownership is on the decline in this country. And when that happens, people still have to live somewhere, so you, you end up having not much choice but to become a renter. And sorry about the people in this slide, but um, <coughs> I thought that could be quite amusing. Um, and when we think about renting, we know that rental affordability is um, decreasing in the country as well. We've got this really nifty tool, the National Rental Affordability Index. You can Google it and find it online. You can look up your own suburb or any suburb in Australia and check out uh, what's going on in terms of rental affordability for you. So this is just a screenshot of uh, the Adelaide region. And there's a slider on the side of the map that, where you can change the, your household income. So you can put your own household income in there. And you can see um, this map has that slider set at $80,000 a year as a household income. The, the cool green colours represent affordability in the private rental market. So if your household income is $80,000 or above, you don't have a problem, okay? When we change that income to lower, you can see what happens to the map. Um, we've changed the household income to $25,000. Um, and the warm colours are the opposite of the cool colours. They represent severe unaffordability in the private rental market. So if your household income is $25,000, there's nowhere affordable for you to rent in the whole state, even in the country. The grey areas represent um, uh, rentals where there's nothing appropriate for you as a single person. So there's not just all these one bedroom units hanging around out there that are, are cheap and available. Um, so if we think of a person receiving New Start, for example, uh, who would be on around $13,000 a year, um, again, there is nothing that we would deem affordable in the whole state of South Australia. Um, so we talk about rental stress a lot, and this is related to those graphs that you've just seen. We look at the bottom two household income quintiles in South Australia, and we say that when those households are paying more than 30% of their household income, they're living with rental stress, that's what we call it. So um, when that happens, and housing's the biggest cost that households face, there's not enough for people to live, um, to, to buy the other things they need. So we know we've got massive electricity bills coming into households in South Australia, um, high unemployment, we've really got a triple whammy of things going on in this state um, that make it very, very difficult for people to pay their rent. And we know that um, over the last nine years, people living with this rental stress, uh, the, the number has doubled in South Australia. So it's, it's a growing problem and doesn't show any signs of going away. Um, and that, so in terms of numbers, um, in 2011-12, uh, there were 94,000 households living on low incomes in the private rental market and uh, that's gone up to 121,000 households. So it's many more people than, than households. So this is not a, a small problem, it's a, it's a really big problem. <clears throat> this was a video, but I'm not sure how to make it. Oh, here we go, I can make it play. Uh, this, this little video, it's very short, and it's about the sell-off of public housing in South Australia.
to start again? Yeah, sorry. So that was just a little animation we made to highlight this issue that after home ownership and the private rental market, the, the next step would be public housing for people to live in who are living on low incomes. And over uh, the last 20 years, we've lost 20,000 uh, public housing properties in this state. You know, where has that money gone? Uh, just to Treasury. Um, it hasn't been reinvested into public housing. So what we now know now is that the gap between what you pay for your rent in a public housing property, which is 25% of your household income, and the cheapest <laughs> private rental, the gap's just so big that we're seeing more and more people experience homelessness in South Australia. So that, that number of 20,000 is very interesting to me because the number of people in a 12-month period who are receiving homelessness services is 23,000 in South Australia. So I don't know if any of you like know, knew that or if that's, you find that quite shocking, but of those 23,000 people, we know there are thousands more people who need assistance but didn't get it, and we know that there are all those thousands of households living in housing stress who have a roof over their head. You know, they're living somewhere, but they're living very unaffordably. And um, unfortunately, uh, we now, you know, move on from public housing to a more residual form of housing, which is boarding houses, you may have heard of. So these are the, the rooming houses, the boarding houses, which are really the rubbish bin of society where people end up that have no other choice um, of where they can live. It's a sector that is run for profit. It's unregulated, so anyone can open a boarding house and you can cram people into bedrooms and charge them quite a bit uh, to live there. And we know that um, often these establishments um, have unscrupulous people running them. So there are uh, drugs coming into the house, there's violence in the house, and these uh, residents who live there don't have the legal protections that um, you and I might have in the private rental market and under the law. So we're seeing them grow and we're seeing people come out of prison and being put straight into boarding houses. We're seeing people come out of hospitals and being placed in boarding houses because there's nowhere else for them to go. And so these are some of our most vulnerable people and we're just kind of relegating them to something that's totally unsuitable and unsafe for them. Um, rather than um, looking after them and housing them properly. So we're, what's the, the housing need for people experiencing homelessness in South Australia? These graphs show actually how many people are missing out from the, the type of housing they need. So crisis accommodation is um, a, a accommodation that if you have nowhere to sleep tonight, we can hopefully um, offer a, a bed for you to stay. But um, we can see that over a year in 2016-17, there were nearly 6,000 people that needed that place to stay tonight. Um, and we only met 60% of, of that need. Um, the, the call for medium term housing in South Australia, um, we're doing, we're faring much uh, worse in that we're not meeting uh, over 60% of the need for that housing. And in terms of long term housing, uh, we're doing really poorly, and, and that this is about uh, public housing and social housing, that um, you can see just in these numbers alone, there are thousands of people and families missing out every year. Um, these are some of those uh, numbers about people experiencing homelessness in South Australia. Um, and we <coughs> know that housing and poverty are political issues. So we work a lot with politicians. And since the, elect the state election uh, last year, we've worked very closely with Michelle Lensing, who's our current Human Services Minister, uh, before the election and since the election, to educate her about um, what we call evidence-based policy, that we need to stop selling off public housing and um, start to reduce the numbers of people experiencing homelessness not sit by and watch them increase uh, every day and every night. So these are her promises. Um, she hasn't gone so far as to say she'll stop the sell-off of public housing, but she certainly wants to stop its decline, its ageing state and the, 
the act of just selling it off to give money to Treasury. Um, she'd like to see more social housing and affordable housing, so um, around that 80 per cent of market rate. She actually is a fan of evidence-based policy, uh, which means we look to data and we look to community expectations and we uh, form policies that um, people want and need. And she wants to include all the stakeholders around the table. So rather than governments just talking to themselves, she's very keen to include the community, which we think is a good idea. Um, and we also uh, eked some promises from Premier Stephen Marshall, specifically around Aboriginal people. And they weren't all to do with housing, but as I mentioned at the beginning, Aboriginal people face you know, uh, huge barriers when it comes to um, renting and achieving housing. So um, the Premier has promised to uh, retain the Aboriginal Affairs portfolio personally, which he has done. He is going to uh, create an Aboriginal housing strategy, hasn't started that yet, but also look at um, Aboriginal people in the workforce and um, having culturally competent and appropriate policy and justice system responses. So we look forward to um, hearing how he's going to achieve those things. Um, South Australia is currently developing a new housing strategy and again, we, we haven't seen any action yet, but we've been busy um, talking to Labor, the Greens, SA Best, to say when this policy is developed, it needs to be a long-term policy to have an effect on our housing situation. So let's not bicker about it in the parliament. Let's uh, get support for it on a high level and uh, start to turn the Titanic around. And on the national level, we know there's a national election coming. Um, we've been working hard through National Shelter to go to Canberra to meet with politicians and write policy platforms, um, calling for a national housing strategy for the country. We don't have one. There's no plan. Uh, we're just doing sort of piecemeal things across the, the, the country. And we really do need that national leadership to make a difference to the homelessness figures. Um, across Australia, there's more than 288,000 people who experience homelessness every year. And 40% of, of those people are children and young people. You know, so we, that is a massive number. And unless we start housing people properly, uh, it's only going to grow. And that's where we one of the key things we call for is this investment in social housing. So what can you do? Um, use your vote very wisely in the upcoming election. If you care about housing, look and see what the, the party you're voting for's policies are. Your local member, what, are, what do they think about housing? Visit them, ask them. You know, we encourage you to do these things. You're all citizens, uh, you know, we've got a vote and we need to use it wisely on this important issue. Um, you can do a lot online. You, don't, you need to go and actually physically go to talk to people and visit people. You can do a lot through your social media if you use social media. You can support Shelter SA and National Shelter. We're on uh, Twitter and Facebook. And you can join our mailing list for free. So there's a couple of things you can do. But sadly, buying people cups of coffee um, and giving blankets does, is a Band-Aid and we need to do much more and start to provide that, that housing and, and that safe home that people need to thrive in this society. And that's me. Thanks very much. Our second speaker is Claudia Yanko. Um, Claudia is a double degree graduate from the University of Adelaide um, with an honours in the Faculty of Arts Philosophy program. Uh, she has worked as a support officer for the city of Salisbury um, and has been the anti-poverty essay coordinator since last year. Um, their aims, that, that is the anti-poverty network's aims, are to advocate for the dignity, rights and well-being of people on low incomes, particularly those receiving income support from Centrelink 
and to create a, communi a community networks that provide emotional and practical support to those affected by poverty, unemployment, and the mean-spirited policies targeting those receiving income support from Centrelink. Claudia is a voice for people living in poverty in South Australia. She highlights the personal experiences and insights of people on low incomes, and by doing so challenges myths about poverty, income support, and unemployment. Please join me in welcoming her back to university. Thank you very, thanks very much, Ali. Um, thank you for that wonderful introduction and for facilitating today. Uh, thank you also to Dr. Alice Clark for that uh, speech that highlights so many crucial issues with uh, the housing here and the declining affordability. Um, thank you to Dr. Stephen Hale for uh, organising this today with the Economics Club and for the awesome speech that you'll give soon. Mm -hmm. And to Gabby and the rest of Get Up for helping to promote and organise this today. So, uh, yeah, I'm Claudia Yenko, co-coordinator of Anti-Poverty Network uh, SA. And we're a grassroots organisation run by and for people with first-hand experience in poverty. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? Yeah, wonderful. And so I'll be talking to you today about the low rate of welfare and the punitive measures against those out of work and uh, affected by those low rates in Australia. So I can't possibly cover everything, but hopefully I'll highlight some of the key issues. Uh, from my experience as someone who's been in poverty and on welfare, as well as someone from my experience as an organiser for grassroots campaigns around these issues. So I'll start by highlighting my own experience to show that situations like mine and worse can happen in a rich country and to give a short background to one of the motivations behind me speaking about issues like this today. So um, I grew up in quite a low socioeconomic area in a household that was quite unstable had a lot of hardship, a lot of uh, severe poverty throughout childhood. Um, and to keep it short, I dealt with a lot of uh, mental illness and drug addiction around the adults uh, in the family close by. So um, that experience, I think, is not a unique one, sadly, to my area or even my school. Uh, I lived on youth allowance, which was when I was that young, living away from home allowance, when I moved out of home uh, at almost 16, and by the time I turned 16. Uh, and I was living on that from when I moved out to when I was uh, finishing my honours degree here at Adelaide. So um, in that time, I worked casual, part-time and cash-in-hand jobs to be able to uh, make enough money to get by while on those allowances as well. And that was obviously some time ago, so things haven't got that much better. Um, but yeah, the main thing I'd like to highlight as well is that I'd, I'd love to say my story was special, um, but the story of the hardworking poor person is a very common one. And so I'd like to highlight a bit about unemployment today and the job market in Australia. So. I go through the Australian Unemployed Workers Union a lot for uh, some of the stats, which we each get together from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. Uh, so at the moment, there are, last I checked, there are approximately nine job seekers for every one job vacancy. So re researchers, students and unemployed people alike will know all too well how much this can turn into situations where a few hundred people will apply for one job that you're going for. This statistic affects workers currently in employment as well because a competitive job market, a job market that's this competitive, makes it easier to keep workers compliant. And so that's a bit of a highlight around, despite the requirements put on people who are unemployed and part-time students, there's not a whole lot of work for them to be going for to get out of their situation very quickly. Um, so I'll move on to 
Freezing welfare payments, cutting support and punitive measures against people on welfare. So to give you a bit of a background, New Start and Youth Allowance, which are the unemployment and young person payments, especially for full-time students, these are indexed to the Consumer Price Index. They haven't gone up in real terms above the Consumer Price Index for almost 25 years, since mid-1994. That's before I was born. Um, Dr. Greg Ogle, in his cost of living support for SACOS, found that the cost of electricity since 1994 has gone up by 212%. So, as uh, Alice has gone through as well, the cost of housing has gone way up. For a renter, if I'm correct, it's gone up by 62% since 1994. And um, as Alice has pointed out as well, the opportunities for people on Newstart getting a house are very low. The survey uh, done by Anglicare of over 67,000 rental properties nationwide found that only three rentals in the nation were affordable for a single person on New Start. So those, that, that came out last year. And despite these stats, the rate of New Start sits at $275.10 a week. That's around $160 a week below the Henderson poverty line. And it's less than 40% of the national minimum wage. Youth allowance is the payment for young people including young people who have to live away from home or are studying full time. This also hasn't been raised in that time and that current rate is less than $230 a week for a single person with no children, less than a third of the minimum wage. Uh, now another huge issue affecting people in poverty is this low rate being frozen to stay there, but also constant cuts to further support in the welfare system. For example, when I was uh, going through uni, uh, moving out all of that, I had the startup scholarship. So I got around a few thousand dollars like a uh, once off when I started, then a, a thousand and something, around a thousand and thirty five dollars a semester to help me get textbooks, all of that. That's been turned into a startup loan. Um, that now gets paid back on your hex debt. So yeah, so if it wasn't low enough, you, you don't get that support um, outright anymore. Another issue with that is the bureaucracy that they do not do anything about before they make these changes. So when my startup scholarship changed from a scholarship to a loan, I was doing honours, uh, can't work as much, can barely afford anything already, um, I had to wait three more months to get that startup loan because uh, they didn't put enough in place to actually go through these applications you now have to do, whereas it was once automated. So this is an example of constant cuts and uh, constant delays, yes, constant inefficiencies and increasing inefficiencies in our welfare system. I'm just making sure I'm going right the time as well. And so this doesn't make much sense, especially for full-time students. Uh, as, you, as many of you in the room know, you can't exactly make up full-time hours of work to get by. But they expect you to live on so much less as if you could. That doesn't make much sense unless our welfare system is based on an assumption that you'll have a lot of support from family and you'll be able to live at home and you'll have a wide network of extended family and close people that you can rely on. Which is a blanket solution that, as I've shown with my experience, does not apply to everyone. And as I've shown with my experience not being unique, many people can fall through the cracks this way. So, um, freezing welfare payments and punishing people, I've gone through that, like that. So this brings me to uh, our welfare system being based on principles over proof of effective strategies. 
and blanket solutions. So unemployed and underemployed people on welfare uh, are assigned to job agencies, unless you're in a full-time student uh, position or some other way of making up your hours of activity, you get assigned to a job network when you're on an unemployment payment or a part-time student sometimes. So um, all unemployed people as well get assigned to a job network under one of three categories. So those include job active for uh, a lot of people, disability employment scheme, for people who have uh, a condition that limits their capacity to work. And then the community development program for remote communities targeted at uh, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities. Um, I will also raise, just uh, putting it out there, last year and the year before, the community development program targeted at ATSI communities had more hours of requirements in a lot of cases than the other two. Um, so when they come to one of these, a job plan is created with a quota of jobs to apply for, no matter what they are. So any person in any of these situations, no matter who you are, part of your job plan is to apply for a quota of jobs a month. Doesn't matter what experience you have, what field you're in, uh, whether you've just got out of work or you got out of it a couple of years ago, uh, with how many jobs there are in your area, you still have to apply for that many a month. Uh, and then you have to do a certain amount of hours of approved activities, which some people will say, oh, you know, that sounds pretty manageable. But in our experience in Anti-Poverty Network, uh, we have an advocacy service for people being misinformed and bullied by their job networks. And a lot of what we hear is that people are told to go to more uh, appointments than they're required or they're told to keep coming into the job agency when uh, they could do the same work at home. Sorry, I might have to pause sometimes because I get short of breath. But yeah, another um, severe blanket solution is that some communities have been targeted for compulsory income management. And that's where half or more of your income is put onto a card, such as this one, that you can only spend in certain shops, uh, like Coles, Woolworths, and you can only spend on certain things, um, excluding tobacco, alcohol, any of that. Uh, but in those areas, if you apply to a certain demographic, you're put on those no matter what. It doesn't matter if you're a high-risk person, it doesn't matter if you're a financial counsellor um, by trade who's just got out of work. If you're in that demographic, you'll be put on that. And so we've had crazy stories about that. I won't go too much into it, but yeah. Communities targeted have included Sejina, the Northern Territory, and uh, this, they've been trying to bring it into the city of Playford here as well, which was where I grew up. Um, and when a lot of these communities were asked if they thought the basics card was a good idea, they weren't presented with an alternative exactly. There, there wasn't really a, would you like this or would you like rehab solutions for actual addicts in your area? Um, there was none of that. They, they got, you get this, as far as I'm aware, you get this or nothing. And uh, a lot of people say like, oh, but you know, it's gonna solve all these issues, it's gonna help people save these lives of these addicts. Um, as someone who grew up around addicts, uh, if they swap that for cash, which they can, and they like have experience in that if they're long-term, um, I'm, I'm their kid, I get less money. Uh, I get less food, because that person who they swap to they, they will charge as well. Um, and then what, what's actually solved? So, I mean, that's one scenario that can happen. Uh, and finally, um, the report from Deloitte Access Economics and Psychos. This, this has been ignored so far by the federal government, which shows how 
uh, how serious they are about economic growth, basically. So, uh, so this report called Analysis of the Impact of Raising Benefit Rates shows that Australia's disposable income would increase by 288 million and consumption by 333 million if New Start and Youth Allowance were raised by $75 a week. And nationally, 12,000 jobs could be created uh, with a 0.2% positive impact on wages. The impact on local councils and states would vary, and those would, the impact would benefit places with high unemployment rates more. Uh, the report does state that that's not necessarily because they're high unemployment rates, but the actual uh, increase to disposable income hits those areas uh, a lot higher. So, if we look at that, these are the top 20 councils in South Australia to benefit from a raise to New Start by $75 a week. Salisbury, uh, last time I checked, which was, I'll admit was a year or two ago, it was one of the highest, it had one of the highest unemployment rates in the state as a council area. It, it, when I checked, it was second. So they get the highest increase to disposable income in the first year, 33.28 million. Then Onka Paringa and Playford, which was, uh, I think at one point was the highest unemployment rate. So you can see all these areas would have a huge increase and uh, obviously that could create a lot more work in the area through um, more local consumption. So I always say if anyone in federal government is serious about creating more jobs and economic growth, they need to be serious about raising new start and youth allowance. And so um, I'd just like to highlight that to show that uh, at the moment that's not happening. At the moment we're getting no commitment to a raise, even though this creates a, a, a few more jobs than some submarines. And uh, so I think I'm getting a bit close to time, so five minutes, yeah? So I'll go a bit over our solutions, what, what we can do, um, and I'll leave the rest to discussion, I think. But in my experience as a a grassroots organiser. Obviously, in coming months and years, I'd like to see a raise to New Start and Youth Allowance above the Henderson poverty line, which sits around 425 a week. Uh, and this should be indexed in a particular way other than the CPI. Uh, a suggestion I have would be to stay at a particular percentage of the minimum wage. And job agencies need to be made a public service with less stringent criteria and waiting times for New Start Youth Allowance and the DSP. Uh, the DSP also needs uh, fewer restrictions on how people can get into it. It needs to be less paperwork heavy, because that makes very little sense. And we need to see fewer people on New Start when they should be on the DSP as well. And yeah, we'll hear more from Dr. Hale about longer term solutions like a job guarantee, which I'm really looking forward to. But I also have a lot to say about how we, how we can practically do these things and make these things come about, which I'll leave some of this to the discussion. But basically, to, leave, to end on a positive note, uh, as a grassroots campaign, we've gained the support of 22 local councils uh, in Australia for a raise to New Start and Youth Allowance, including 15 in the state, and these openly support that raise. These councils collectively represent around 1.7 million people, uh, and that's a good start when you don't have enough for a plebiscite. Uh, and the Local <coughs> Government Association of Australia and of SA each support a raise as well. Then leading welfare organisations obviously support a raise, as do trade unions and sections of the business community, including the Business Council of Australia, <coughs> Deloitte Access Economics, and multinational accounting firm KPMG. And all of the crossbenchers of the lower house of federal parliament and key Senate crossbenchers as well now support an increase to New Start. A few, a few years ago, this was barely glossed over in public debate. Now we're getting support of local councils 
who aren't brushing it off as a federal issue. We're getting support of business associations and associations in the sector, which are recognising their part to play in getting this raise. And none of this would be possible today without grassroots movements that include the expertise of people with first-hand experience of poverty. Um, so I'll leave further things to discussion, but thank you for listening to me today and thank you for uh, your support for this event. And I look, I look forward to hearing more for the rest of the night. Now I'm moving on to our third speaker, Dr. Stephen Hale. Um, Stephen has insisted that I do not waste any time introducing him. <laughs> so all I'll say is um, he's an economist at the University of Adelaide, um, the best lecturer I've ever had in my studies, and um, an advocate for a federal job guarantee and an approach to macroeconomics called modern monetary theory. Um, please join me in introducing Stephen Hale. Excuse me a moment while I put my old man glasses on. I can either see the computer these days or I can see how beautiful you all are. So um, it's probably more important that I see the computer for the moment. Here we go. Um, I'm going to talk to you about a federal job guarantee and an income guarantee. But first of all, I wanted to thank you all so much for coming along. Uh, it's uh, really stressful organising something like this, even with the support of all the people that have um, helped me out. And I'm so grateful that everybody's come because I've, uh, I had a nightmare in the middle of the night that Alice was here and... Claudia was here and there was no one else. <laughs> um, initially, what I wanted to do was to encourage a few students to come along and to listen to uh, Alice and Claudia talking about the kind of issues that you don't usually get to listen to. And then uh, Gabby Bond from uh, Get Up got on board and uh, it was promoted uh, more generally and that's that's why so many of you come along. As I said, I'm, I'm very grateful for that. I'm grateful for the chance to highlight issues like, yes, housing and homelessness and uh, absolute and relative poverty and inequality and involuntary unemployment and underemployment in Australia. All of these things are difficult to define, difficult to measure. All of them are interrelated. All of them will be seriously under-discussed in the federal election, in my view. I was lucky enough uh, a few days ago to be invited to an event at the university which was addressed by the very able um, and uh, intelligent and uh, his heart's in the right place, uh, shadow assistant treasurer. And he was talking about how if he was to become the assistant treasurer after the federal election, the new government would target inequality in Australia. And I got to ask him a question because it was organised by some of my students, including Ali, I think. Um, and the question I asked was, well, in Australia, we had a Scandinavian level of inequality in the 1960s and early 70s. Actually, in countries like Denmark, they still have a Scandinavian level. Of inequality. I said inequality has risen almost continuously in Australia, however you measure it, since about 1974, which, by the way, was the last year when there was genuinely full employment in Australia. And in my question, I first of all said, there's been Labour governments for quite a lot of the time since then, while inequality has been rising. What do you think they did wrong? 
And the second question I said, it's great that you're targeting inequality now. Um, what's the target going to be? You target the budget. Both the government and the opposition will be vying during the election campaign, promising to have bigger budget surpluses, in my view, pointlessly bigger budget sur surpluses than each other, which they probably won't record anyway. What's your target for inequality going to be? And to be fair to him, he said, I don't think I could persuade the shadow cabinet to have an explicit target for it. Well, I want a target for inequality. I don't see why Australia can't, over time, not overnight, have a return to Scandinavian levels of inequality, or if you like, it was a different society than in all sorts of ways, but the level of inequality in Australia that used to exist back in the mid-1970s, and I think part of this also involves a return to genuine full employment. I think if we could restore genuinely full employment in Australia, then many of these other issues and social problems that we discuss would actually become much more manageable over time. Way back in the 1930s, in 1936, John Maynard Keynes, that's the guy on the left, um, wrote these words. The outstanding faults of the economic society in which we live are its failure to provide for full employment and its arbitrary and inequitable distribution of wealth and incomes. Well, somebody could write that now. Those words still apply now. Uh, to an extent, they uh, applied less severely during the period from 1945 to about 1975, when, as I said, there was full employment in Australia. You young people won't believe this, but Robert Menzies almost lost an election in this country in 1962, when the unemployment rate in the days when there was no underemployment in Australia went slightly above 2%. That was seen as a scandal in those days. The average level of unemployment was one point something percent in those days with no underemployment. Well, I don't see any reason why we can't have full employment again. And let's see if this will work. If this does work, I'll play you the first 35 seconds. There's no more time. No time for more. Politicians are of this obsessed video. with jobs. Jobs, 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 jobs. Unemployment, work, and job creation dominate modern political conversations. But are our politicians really doing everything they could be to put ordinary people into dignified, meaningful, and secure work? Absolutely not. I want to talk to you today about a policy that I think is going to become one of the biggest ideas of the next decade. It's called a Federal Jobs Guarantee. If yes, that's enough. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, he's going to do the talk for me, and he'll do it much better than me. And he's younger than me, and better looking than me. So we'll get rid of him. But yes, he was talking about a big idea. I want you to think big. I want... There are some members of the Australian Labour Party. There are some members of the Australian Greens here. We are pushing them both as far as the federal job guarantee is concerned in all sorts of avenues at the moment, and I think they're beginning to crack. Things are moving in our direction. I want them to think big, not small, and that big idea that I want them to think about is introducing a federal job guarantee. After all, this is extremely likely to happen in the US if there is a change of president after the next election. Bernie has been pushing the federal job guarantee for a while now, as has Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and Stephanie Kelton, um, that my fellow modern monetary theorist, who is Bernie Sanders' chief economic advisor, and by the way, is due to visit this university in, at some point in September or October this year as a Harcourt visiting professor. We haven't firmed up the date yet, but she's promised me 100% she's coming. Bernie's been so successful that it's now almost a requirement, if you want to be a candidate for the Democratic nomination, to either come up with your own version of a job guarantee or to support his. So Kamala Harris... Elizabeth Warren, Kirsten Killibrand, Cory Brooker, they're all leading candidates 
for the Democrat nomination. They've all advocated for a job guarantee of one kind or another or have said that they will support it. Consequently, the federal job guarantee has been very widely discussed in the US for some time now, although it has not yet been so widely discussed in Australia. And there's been a lot of opinion polling. And on the whole, you find that there is majority support for a federal job guarantee in the US when it's explained to people in virtually every state. There's an overwhelming majority amongst Democrats. There's an overwhelming majority amongst independents. It's about 50-50 amongst Republicans in the US as far as a federal job guarantee is concerned. The federal job guarantee, the way we have designed it, uh, has come out of the work of a group of economists called Modern Monetary Theorists. Stephanie, of course, is one of them. It's particularly associated in Australia with the work of somebody called Professor Bill Mitchell from the University of Newcastle. And it's the first plank in GetUp's uh, economic justice campaign, the future to fight for campaign. There it is. The government should guarantee work for all to make sure that every Australian who wants the dignity of full-time paid work with all the attached benefits can have one and in the process can improve our public services and local communities. Is this insanity? Well, we've got at least one Nobel Prize winning economist behind future to fight for, Joseph Stiglitz. Those were his words when the uh, campaign was launched. Stephanie Kelton, of course, supported it, has been to Australia once already in support of this campaign. And you can tell it's not been widely discussed in Australia by the fact that when they were looking for an Australian economist to quote on their website, they ended up with me. Uh, anyway, it was nice to be connected in some way or another with uh, Stephanie and, and Joseph Stiglitz. What is a job guarantee? Quickly. It is the offer of public sector employment with a decent income, yes, at the minimum wage, but I would be pitching the minimum wage somewhat higher than it is at the moment, say $20 an hour, with superannuation and good working conditions to everybody who is not in full-time employment at the moment who wants a job. It should be flexible so that you, should, you can work between one and you can make it 38 if you like, but I think that the job guarantee over time should be part of a campaign for us to reduce our standard hours of work rather than increase them. It should be voluntary. No compulsion is involved. No loss of income support for those who choose not to participate. Actually, people like me advocate for something like the new start payment to become unconditional for people on low incomes at the moment. If you want to stay on that level and not participate in a job guarantee, fine. If you participate in a job guarantee full time, you'll be on about $40,000 a year, including superannuation. So you'll be making more than twice as much money. We're not taking anything away from people if we introduce a federal job guarantee. We're giving people an option, a public employment option. And at the moment, our legal minimum wage, of course, isn't a minimum at all. Because you have to have a job before you qualify for the minimum wage. If you're, you know, if you're being breached, you're not even getting new start. But in which case, the minimum for you is zero, I suppose. Um, with a federal job guarantee, the wage paid to people participating in the job guarantee would be a genuinely effective minimum wage across the economy as a whole. Um, the idea is not to compete with private sector employers across the income distribution, but it's to set an effective floor, both to wages and to working conditions, which employers have to match and have to be able to match if they want people to, to work for them. It's really important to get people out of unemployment and into fairly paid work. It's really important to end the curse of underemployment. Yes, we've got an official unemployment rate of only 5% at the moment, but you know, I haven't got time to uh, uh, go through the statistics now in, in detail. You, you know how difficult it is to be officially unemployed. We've got uh, about 8.3% of our labour force um, is 
underemployed. People have at least one hour of paid employment a week, but they want, they want more work. Um, as I said at the beginning, there's various ways of measuring, measuring poverty. One commonly used way of measuring relative poverty is to say that you're poor if you're on below 50% of the median disposable income. Um, once you've uh, taken democratic, char democratic characteristics of households into account, if you are unemployed, you are most likely to fall into this definition of poverty. If you are employed part-time, okay, it's a much smaller proportion of people, but there are only about a quarter of people who are part-time employed who want more hours anyway, so it's still about two-thirds of people who are underemployed. If you're in full-time employment, unless you've got children, um, if you're in full-time employment, even at the uh, minimum wage, you're not going to come into this category, this definition of poverty. So, for the most part, if we could move people out of unemployment, if we could move people out of involuntary underemployment, we could move people out of poverty. Why don't these people do it for themselves? Why don't they pull themselves up by their bootstraps instead of sitting around living off the taxpayer, some people would say. Um, well, it's just not possible. There are 680,000 people who are officially unemployed based on the most recent figures. There are over a million people who are underemployed. There are nearly 900,000 people who are classified as marginally attached. That means they've been looking for work recently, but they're not available to start work this week. Or they would like to start work now, but they haven't actively been looking recently. Those two groups are counted as marginally attached. And Claudia was saying that there were about nine job seekers for every uh, vacant job. If you look at the, if you exclude the marginally attached because of improvements in the labour market recently, it comes out a little bit less than that. But if you include some of these marginally attached, it comes out much more than that, far more than that. No wonder so many people apply for each vacant job. The fact is that the private sector on its own has never, never ever provided enough jobs for all those who want a job. So you can make people apply for 20 jobs a month. It's just going to mean that there are a lot of applicants for jobs, many of whom are unsuited to them. Employers hate it. Nobody likes that requirement. Um, in the days when there was uh, full-time, sorry, in the days when there was full employment in Australia, back in the 50s and 60s and early 70s, it was because the government uh, accepted a responsibility to deliver full employment. It was part of the United Nations Declaration of Human Rights after the Second World War. There was a government white paper which committed successive governments in Australia to maintain full employment. And the same was true in other countries too. And this continued until the mid-70s, then it changed. Of course, we now have a system which, as Claudia was saying, is punitive. It's not about the government taking responsibility to ensure that there are enough job opportunities there for people who want to work, who want to contribute towards social provisioning. I would like to go back to that situation. We can't go back to the society that existed in the 50s and 60s, and we wouldn't want to. So we need a, a new way of delivering full employment, and that's what a job guarantee is all about. And don't tell me there's nothing that needs doing. Walk around some of our suburbs, and you can see plenty of things that need doing. Um, there have been surveys done a number of times down the years by people like Bill Mitchell at the University of Newcastle, uh, talking to local authorities around the country. I haven't taken the, what, what's on this slide directly from any of those surveys. This is just what came to mind as far as I'm concerned. If you were unemployed and there was a federal job guarantee in place, you would go to your local jobs bank. This would not be a private sector organisation. This is part of the state. This would be under a new Commonwealth Employment Service if it was down to me. And you could be working in a variety of different roles. We'd have a Minister for Employment again, not a Minister for Jobs and Small Business, but a Minister for Employment. We wouldn't have a job active network anymore that we spend one and a half billion dollars on a year that's one and a half billion dollars going to the organisations that run it. 
we'd have a public sector Commonwealth employment service. Again, there'd be offices in the capital cities and major, rural, major regional centres like Newcastle. And in every local authority, there'd be a job guarantee local office. And if you were unemployed, you'd go to the job guarantee local office. And if you wanted to participate, you'd go to the job guarantee local office. And you'd see a counsellor. And there'd be a variety of employment opportunities available to you. The private sector, I don't think, should play any role in this scheme. So we're talking about government employers here. You could be working for a charity or not-for-profit organisation. That would be one option, but you could be working in environmental <coughs> services like some of those jobs on the last slide suggested, or community care, or working on small infrastructural projects, or working in a cultural services role. In the New Deal in the 1930s in the US, there were lots of artists and actors and writers who were employed. Um, uh, uh, in New Deal programs, and there's no reason why we couldn't do the same sort of thing in the job guarantee. You would need a national template that was laid down by the Commonwealth Government, but you would then allow local government to prioritise um, uh, uh, jobs and uh, to change the way that the federal job guarantee works, so you wouldn't have the same tasks being done, the same jobs being done in I don't know, the centre of Sydney as you would in some rural and remote area. People who are unemployed are not unemployed because they're unproductive. If you talk about a federal job guarantee, you always get people say, well, these people, they're unproductive, what are you going to have them doing? Unemployment is not, in general, the fault of the unemployed. Otherwise, there wouldn't be 10 people to apply for every available job. It's just the fact there aren't enough jobs. And the fact there aren't enough jobs is not because there's not plenty to do. It's because of a lack of funding. Anyway, if you're talking about productivity, these people at the moment, if they're unemployed, are doing not very much, perhaps. So if the alternative is unemployment, job guarantee jobs have a low productivity hurdle to jump. We do not need to make a profit from a job guarantee scheme. Indeed, we don't want to make a profit from it. The government budget is close to balance at the moment. It should be 1.5% or 2% in deficit. This would deliver that deficit. This would create a fiscal balance which I think is appropriate given the state of our economy at the moment. And of course... Job guaranteed jobs would contribute to the welfare of participants. There are a wide variety of non-financial costs of unemployment that I won't go through just now. And the jobs that people are doing as part of this job guarantee uh, should be designed to benefit the local community. And non-participants will benefit not only from that, but from the security of knowing that if you lose your job, you'll be able to participate in the job guarantee, which will give you more bargaining power if you're in a terrible job or a really low-paid job at the moment anyway. This is not work for the dole. Work for the dole is punitive. Work for the dole is something you have to do in order to get new starts. Nobody's talking about taking away new start payments. Nobody's talking about a federal job guarantee being compulsory. It is an option which would be available to you which doesn't exist at the moment. And it's not a question of a job guarantee or a universal basic income either. I don't want to talk about a universal basic income now. Um, but there's no particular reason why you couldn't campaign for both if you thought that was feasible. An above poverty level job guarantee is not inflationary. We don't need to raise taxes in order to pay for it. We could implement a federal job guarantee now without increasing anybody's taxes at all. It is not incredibly expensive to do as far as the budget is concerned. And as I said, I think, given the state of the Australian economy at the moment, it would move the government budget balance to roughly where it ought to be in any case. It can empower the low paid and those in insecure employment. And as I said, it can address the non-financial costs of unemployment. And it also helps to stabilise the economy. The government's budget already acts as an automatic stabiliser to an extent. So when we had the global financial crisis and Australia almost had a recession, 
about a half of the turnaround in the government budget at the time just happened automatically because tax receipts fell and welfare payments increased. A job guarantee would uh, uh, improve the efficiency of the government budget as an automatic stabiliser because um, in a boom, when the economy was growing faster, then the size of the job guarantee pool would shrink. People would move out of the job guarantee into better paid jobs in the private sector and maybe elsewhere in the public sector. On the other hand, when you need the government to do more deficit spending during a downturn to support the economy, well, the job guarantee would uh, automatically increase in size. And many of those things I was talking about on the previous slide are scalable activities. You could have more people working in them when you need to and fewer people when the economy is booming. It means spending where, when and on whom the spending needs to go. An untargeted fiscal stimulus tends to create inflation and is therefore inefficient because, of course, the people that benefit from it are the people that don't need the help in the first place. It creates a demand for skills which are in short supply and create structural problems in the economy. A federal job guarantee takes workers as they are, gives people training opportunities if they want to undertake them, but allows people to decide whether they want to undergo more training when they're in a job guarantee or whether they don't. Um, a federal job guarantee will offer employment to the nearly 100,000 people in Australia who've been unemployed for more than two years who the private sector sees as damaged goods and who are unlikely on that basis to get a job in the near future and are likely other to, uh, otherwise to remain unemployed. A federal job guarantee will involve spending more where it needs to be spent. If you want people to stop moving to Sydney and Melbourne because they're being forced to in order to get a job, if you want to continue to have rural communities and remote communities being viable, then a job guarantee will help you do that. It puts money into those areas which can then be spent in local businesses. It maintains social cohesion and supports and revives communities doing it tough. But it's not a new idea, not really. Job guarantee-like programs have been successfully implemented on a large scale in the recent past. Plan HEFES, which was a, a, a something which Argentina introduced immediately after their last economic <laughs> crisis uh, in 2002, uh, rapidly included 2 million people, which was 13% of the labour force in Argentina at the time. It did so without being inflationary. The programme naturally shrunk over time as Argentina's economy performed quite well leading up to the global financial crisis after China, I think it may have been the highest growing economy in the world in the middle part of the 2000s. Regrettably, when they shouldn't have done, they phased it out when Argentina wasn't in a crisis anymore. There's been a rural employment guarantee in India for a long time now, and it's a massive program. There's 50 million people in it. Don't tell me we can't administer a job guarantee with maybe 500,000 people in it. It's not perfect in all sorts of ways. It's squeezed for funding by the government. When the current Indian government came in, they would have liked to scrap it, but they couldn't scrap it because it was too popular. And that's the same thing we'd have here. If we got a federal job guarantee right, it would be so popular the governments of both persuasions would find it very difficult to remove once it was in place. I have already mentioned Roosevelt's New Deal in the 1930s, which, by the way, a famous economist called Hyman Minsky, as a very young man, was a participant in. And Minsky started pushing for what he called an employer of last resort scheme, which has turned into our federal job guarantee proposal now, way back in the 1960s. People have been calling on governments to stop using unemployment and poverty and inequality to control inflation for 40 years, and that's what I'm doing. Now, that's what I think we should all do, not just to the coalition, but to the Labour Party as well, across an election campaign when we're talking to people who want to represent us in Canberra, want to take big decisions. If we could have full employment 
back in the 1960s, if we could have Scandinavian levels of inequality in the early 70s, why can't we do it again? So, a job guarantee. It has to be federally funded. Like New Start, there has to be no cap on the total spending on it. There needs to be a cap per job. Sure, 40,000 plus about another 50% for capital and admin costs, and it would depend on the range of activities that uh, 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 people were working on in the job guarantee, but it would end up costing, on average, probably about 1.5% of GDP, but I don't care about that. I mean, it's not the right way of thinking about it, really. As I said, the government budget needs to move towards deficit at the moment anyway. It should meet local needs. It should be available to everyone. It should be compulsory for no one. Given the experience of recent years, it's important that profit doesn't come into it and that with the exception perhaps of small cooperatives, the private sector is not involved. It should help stabilise the economy across the cycle for the reasons I've, I've been saying. It sets the appropriate fiscal deficit at the margin. How do you know you've got the fiscal deficit, right, when the last person walks into a job guarantee office? Um, it sets the minimum social wage and the minimum acceptable working conditions. It will be important, as far as possible, to ensure that it doesn't overlap with non-job guarantee jobs, including in the public sector. It should nurture participants. There should be no, as I said, nobody's being forced to participate. It should not be an emergency measure. It should be permanent, like Medicare or like the Australian Army. It's not something we're going to get rid of. And the jobs involved, if they don't actually improve our ecological environment, they at least should not damage it. So to that extent, it should be green. Two, we certainly need a change. I thought I'd give you a quote from the Chief Executive of the Council of Small Business Organisations Australia in case you thought only lefties uh, were rather cynical about the current, uh, our current way of dealing with people who are unemployed and need help to get back into the labour force. This is a quote from Peter Strong. We are creating millionaires on the back of the long-term unemployed by paying providers to offer a failed service. The people that win are the service providers, not the unemployed or the employers. As I've said, most employers really do not like getting lots of unsuitable job applications from people who are being forced to apply for 20 jobs, any old job, every month in order to keep their new start payment. The whole system needs to be turned on its head. And these were not my words, these were his. <laughs> I just want to make that clear. A message for laissez-faire economists. He said, not me. <laughs> you are a bunch of shallow intellects who have failed all of us due to your lazy pomposity End message, <laughs> said the Council of Small Business Organisations, Australia Chief Executive Officer. So, the job guarantee is one element of Get Up's Future to Fight For campaign. You can see I've mentioned a guaranteed basic income. We've been talking about a roof over every head. There are some other things too which would be interesting to talk about here on another occasion. Our view, the view of people like Stephanie and me, as far as the government's budget is concerned, is that it's more important to balance the economy than to balance the budget. And when we've got, as I said, nearly 100,000 people who've been unemployed for more than two years, then that's not what I call balancing the economy. If you're interested, given that I am an economic spokesman for Get Up, if you're interested in getting involved in the Future to Fight For campaign and Get Up's other campaigns, then Gabrielle Bond, the organiser, there she is, for Get Up in South Australia, <laughs> is here. So you could have a chat to her. Otherwise, thanks very much for listening to me. And again, thank you very much to Claudia and to Alice and to Ali for helping out. And in the case of Claudia and Alice for their uh, excellent presentations. And uh, we look forward to having some questions. Thank you very much.